Hey, Colleen, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have the show as well. So we were just, just before we hit the record button saying that, I was saying that it's been two years that I was, that I just rejigged a little bit of, even though the podcast has been going on for five, close to six years, uh, I've kind of like rethought about what I wanted it to be. And I thought this tagline to, for the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast to be where play meets strategy. And with the ambition of really playing tabletop role-playing games with strategists, and I dabbled a little bit in that last year. Uh, and uh, but this is the first time, oh, not the well, yeah, no, it is the first time. I'm looking forward to because we were on a uh, episode of Mark Pollard Sweathead podcast last year, and I learned that you play Dungeons and Dragons, so you're a tabletop <laughs> role player, and like I yeah. am as well. And I, I reached out to you about being on the show and found uh, a gaming opportunity. And so we're going to mix in conversation about strategy and about whatever else we come up to in the conversation with playing an actual game, which I'm looking forward to. And this is my first time playing this game. So uh, there could be high hopes that because I do strategy for a living, I could be an excellent game strategist. That may not be the case. So just putting that out there. <laughs> I, I have exactly the same thing going on. Uh, I, I, I'm repeating what you said, just said before, but I'm quite a little bit nervous to go, well, it's, it's I've played role-playing games since I was like 12. Uh, so I have been also a GM for a long time, not since I was 12, but like 15 or something. Uh, but I've never, I was never a very assiduous player or assiduous GM. So uh, friends who have like as much as long, like as, who are as old as me tend to have a lot more experience. But yeah. also I've not necessarily shared like a live way of playing this game with professional acquaintances that I know in strategy who might tend to listen to this podcast, let alone yeah. students. Uh, yeah. And I also wonder, okay, if, do the people who follow podcasts about role-playing games, are, gonna, are they gonna be interested in this? Because yeah. they're gonna do a little bit of both. I believe yes. And I think the one of the things that can tie both of those areas together in like super geeky and specific area is design. Because yeah, there's a lot absolutely. of people I know who follow and listen to podcasts around role-playing games that are interested in game design mm -hmm. and uh, in the idea of design as intent. And I think there's one way or another we'll be talking about that at some point. And mm -hmm. hopefully that's an area that's going to be interesting. I'm sure it's not going to be the only one. So we'll see. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. It's going to be cool. And uh, I guess to start with, it'd be great to have a bit of a an intro to, I mean, typically people that know me from the show, but who are you coming? Can you give us a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, you and your, well, both your, your job as a strategist and what you tend to do and and, and how, and uh, and perhaps also a little bit about the, the gaming side of things as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Colleen. Uh, I live in Toronto. Uh, I've been a uh, strategist for, uh, you know, brand company. Are you editing this a little bit? Uh, very little. Usually okay. not. Because <laughs> okay. the longer I, I, mean, I can remove things, but honestly, okay. it takes a long time to edit. So yeah, okay. I'll uh, try not to then. But it's okay. It's the authenticity that we're looking for here. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so I've been a strategist for about 15 years now. Uh, I've done mostly working with uh, pharma and alcohol. And uh, I also do a lot of tech, Facebook, Google, that kind of stuff. So uh, just in case, yeah. in case like any of more, any people that are like friends or people, acquaintances from the more of the gaming side of things who might not know what a strategist is, what's your usual, do you have That's a usual fair. simple way to explain it? Because it's always one of the difficult questions, but you know, it's such a funny job. Yeah, I know. So basically I feel, I bring the cultural and human perspective to business problems. Right. Uh, mostly they're on the brand related side. Sometimes they're on innovation. Uh, but my job is to understand people and culture by doing first person research uh, and where the intersection of business challenges uh, meet with culture and uh, human needs. Great. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. And you uh, tend to, to work across the U.S. or internationally, wherever or... Yeah, it's mostly North America, uh, but do do uh, some work in the UK. It's changed a bit because of COVID, uh, sure. time changes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I'm working for myself for a couple of years. So it's a job that uh, that I love enough 
uh, to do on my own steam. Great. So perfect. this is great talking to people and noodling on things together is what I love. Yeah, and I and I want to keep an eye out for something else that we mentioned while we're while during the whole episode, something to keep in the background for anybody, particularly on the strategy communication brand side of things who might be uh, watching or listening to us. This idea that, and particularly that I, I believe in, that there's really a huge amount of value in playing role playing games, uh, and to for anybody listening to think about if you don't know what might that value be. Yeah. Uh, I- Totally agreed. I would say early on in my career, I took a lot of improv classes Mm. that really helped with me being comfortable talking to strangers and doing research and being flexible in the moment when unexpected things arise. Uh, And then I actually only got into RPG games. I was about three years ago and I'm 40. So I got into it late in life, but I got into it initially to become a better storyteller to become a better collaborator and to have more opportunities to observe how people think through things uh, and make decisions not related to a specific work objective, just to exercise that part of my mind. Um, And so it's kind of a funny story, but I used to get lash extensions pre-COVID and my lashes plays Dungeons and Dragons. He's much younger than me. Uh, he said I could play with them, and three years later, we still play once or twice a month. That's fantastic. That's a great yeah. story. And yeah. also, it, it's also great to just say, because I know some people less than before, and I think mostly thanks to shows like Critical Role and a lot of uh, actual plays, Dungeons & Dragons is massively popular. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it's great just to, to hear that, you know, for anybody who might be intimidated, there's a lot of different ways in. Uh, yeah. Dungeons and Dragons and obviously being the biggest one, but I would also say that it's a little bit of the tip of the iceberg, even though it's a big tip of the iceberg. There's tons of other things going on in Belize as well, which I'm usually interested in. Totally agreed. You don't need, if you're interested about it, you don't need to have started at a young age. You can get into it. Um, and I also, you know, similarly at the same time, started getting into video games for the first time, uh, again, late in life. Uh, but you really see how other games are built off of the initial premise of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and it, it does actually change your strategy mind as you go through the learning curve yeah. of playing games because you enter into a situation and you see the screen very differently than you would uh, if you didn't know how games were made and how they played. And you can apply that to uh, entering into any situation how are you reading and understanding the cues in the room and how they interact with one another? Awesome. Yeah, and this is fantastic. And uh, and I think I'll, I'll be able to use this as a, as a bit of a segue. I also participate in a French speaking, because I'm in Paris and uh, French, French, well, I speak French as well, uh, um, role-playing game podcast, a discussion one, that we focus on role-playing game design theory. And uh, it's it's super interesting. And I usually consider myself to be the um, uh, the uh, the dunce of the group. <laughs> like I'm the least knowledgeable uh, and the one who played the least, but somehow I'm still accepted in the group because I have interesting things to say. Apparently, um, yeah, yeah. But, but it's it's something that I really really uh, love looking at, and uh, which I'll use this as a good segue to talk about the game we're going to be playing and to start introducing it. So uh, the, there's this idea that I mentioned already that design and the, one of the definitions of design is intent. And one of, the de- uh, one of the types of discussions that we have is like, what is this game intending to do? And I, one of the games I discovered uh, last year uh, is a system called Gumshoe. It's a role-playing game system, tabletop role-playing game system created by Robin D. Laws. And this, the idea of this system is to, it's entirely dedicated to create investigative mystery style stories. Uh, And the design, the main design principle is to say, well, actually when you're conducting an investigation or trying to solve a mystery and that kind of story, and you're the protagonist and the, the, the character leading that story, it's never interesting to fail to find a clue. Because there are game systems where you can totally fail to find a clue and there are people who play tabletop role-playing games in such a way. So that's the the main founding principle is like, how are we going to design a system that makes it interesting to have an investigation? And the other side of that is to actually to say that what's really interesting is to have a lot of clues and to try to manage to sort out which are the ones that are going to lead you to the right 
uh, to, the, uh, to the solution to this mystery, to this investigation. And the game we're playing is there's a version of the, ga of the game system called One to One. So it's specifically designed for one person telling the story and one person playing. So that's going to be you and I'm going to be the game moderator or game, uh, game master, depending on how you use the acronyms. Usually around Dungeons and Dragons is the DM, Dungeon Master. Um, or there's storyteller, there's narrator, there's arbiter, there's all sorts of different types of words to say the same thing, which is in role-playing games for anybody who's not familiar, the way that we tell a story together is usually, I, I like to say, and I've heard this definition from other game designers, it's a collaborative storytelling experience. Uh, and one person, and there are games without necessarily one person leading, but this is a type of game where there's one person leading, which is me, uh, and I will tell you, Colleen, everything that's going on about the world, and I will interpret all the characters that you meet, and you are going to manage your own character. And the game we're playing is called Cthulhu Confidential. And Cthulhu Confidential is a game that is designed to take uh, a lot of inspiration from the film noir genre uh, and to emulate the twists and turns of a crime story by Raymond Chandler or probably maybe a little bit more emulating the kind of movies that they were adapted into, like The Big Sleep. And I watched a few of them in the past couple of weeks, which was really a lot of fun. I watched The Big Sleep and I watched Out of the Past and I watched Double Indemnity. I that is one of my- The Maltese Falcon. Double Indemnity is fantastic. It's so one good. of my favorite movies of all time. I'm not surprised. I had never seen yeah, it. I was like, this great. is really, really, really good movie. That in Chinatown? So and Chinatown, I haven't seen in a very long time. I also ended up watching because I saw it totally appear on Amazon and uh, on Prime, and I was I realized that I hadn't seen it. I watched The Aviator. Uh, that is not exactly a film noir, but who are Howard Hughes being a huge figure of Los Angeles in the 1930s, uh, it matters. And well, at least it has, mm -hmm. has a big influence on just the general. And it was a cool movie. And so, well, that, that segues into we are playing in an environment of uh, Los Angeles in 1937. And uh, so this is a fictionalized version of Los Angeles because there's the Cthulhu part, if ever you've never heard the word, but it's, you may well have heard the word Cthulhu. And Cthulhu represents something to do with uh, what's called the genre of H.P. Lovecraft, who is a writer from the 1920s. And uh, his, what's been pinned down as the style or the genre that he writes is cosmic horror. And the idea being that there is, uh, well, all of his stories, and there's, I think we exchanged a few messages, we'll talk maybe if, about some of the uh, titles like Lovecraft Country that I still haven't seen, but that's very inspired by his writings, I believe, uh, or at least the ambience and the atmosphere. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of, so it's kind of like normal settings with a background of heavy supernatural ancient gods with the fear being that you know, ordinary men and women who got caught into being curious about something they shouldn't be, uh, find out about what's really terrifying when you're confronted to how huge and timeless the universe could be and how like short your, your life is in comparison with that kind of vastness. There's a lot of those kinds of themes. Uh, and this is also to mention that there is a, well, we're probably not going to get there, but, you know, this story deals with a little, little bit of, let's say, adult, quote unquote, themes going into the genre of the film noir. So there's gangsters and betrayals and crosses, double crosses, but also with an undertone of mystery of supernatural horror going on in the background. So there's the risk of your character uh, possibly dying a horrible fate at the end of the movie. And at the end of the story, you're not going to die in a silly fashion, but you may well die as a consequence of your actions, such as double indemnity, which is a really good example yes. <laughs> of how the character, without giving anything too much away, but I don't think it's giving much away to say that in some film noir, the character kind of like doesn't make it at the end. So that gives me an out in case I don't make it through. They're like, hey, that was part of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, so I have a little bit of a blurb that I'm going to half read, half tell about Los Angeles in 1937 for to place this a little bit in the context. And then we'll I'll share my screen to show a little bit the game pieces for anybody watching on video, which is not super necessary for anybody listening. And uh, then we'll get into who you are as a character. And you were playing a hard boiled, typical Shamus, private detective, Dexter Dex Raymond. Uh, operating in the hard-boiled fictional Los Angeles 1937.
beneath the beguiling surfaces, corruption rules. Dig down past that seeding layer of human indifference and the one obsessed enough to keep looks to keep looking finds a deeper occulted indifference of cosmic proportions. That obsession belongs to you, the private detective, witness to a coming reckoning. You're gonna walk down insane avenues and hope not to go insane yourself. And at the turn of the century, this city, you wouldn't have called it more than a sleepy cow town. From rich ranching and farm wonders settling in and to the discovery of thick reservoirs of oil to the early days of the picture, the prohibition were room times from a couple hundred thousand people to over two and a half million souls in less than 40 years. Take the American experience in all of its garish grasping glory, collapse it all in a span of less than 40 years, and really you have the sprawling chaos that is Los Angeles today in 1937. The business establishment, the cops, the crooks operate not as a mere alliance, but as different arms of the same organization, the system. The Great Depression dealt the town a hard left in the gut. Banks died, property empires cratered, foreclosures swept through like through town like a seismic uh, shock, seismic shock, sorry. Uh, Los Angeles shed its rep as an ever-growing utopia to claim a much more dubious honor as the globe suicide capital. Death sirens call brought so many defeated souls to throw themselves off Pasadena's Colorado Street Bridge in the abyss of the Arroyo Seco Canyon that everyone called it Suicide Bridge for several years. Fortunately, those depression days are mostly in the past now, but the system is as strong as ever and the corruption too. The, blue to, the beautiful blue skies haven't visibly darkened. Palm trees are still swaying in the nice Pacific Ocean breeze, but past the shimmer, the city's daytime beauty goes ink dark and eerie at night. All right, let me share my screen a little bit and I'll, I'll walk through what we have. And, uh, and at the same time, it'll be an opportunity. Can you see on the screen? Yeah. Great, perfect. And so here I have set up a few elements on a shared mirror board that we're both on to give you a little bit of an idea and also should hopefully work out correctly. So we're, this is what we're playing, Cthulhu, Confid Cthulhu Confidential. And this is your character, Dexter Dex Raymond, the private detective, typical hard-boiled private detective. And in the game, you have uh, a certain number of investigative abilities. And the idea is while you're talking to people, depending on uh, how you're gonna solve the case, you're gonna tell me how you want to use those investigative abilities. They're classified in three different sections. They are uh, interpersonal, where you have the two little heads, there are academic ones that are more kind of like base knowledge, uh, and they are, and they have their, some of those are technical. So uh, all the important clues I will give, but typically you kind of have to work for them in the way that you know you want to tell me what you're using or what you might find, what information you might find, or you might be able to find out by using such and such skills. Typically, if you're missing anything important, I'll tell you. And then your abilities are things that are used in challenges where. It, the story would be as interesting if you fail or if you succeed. That's why they split out into two different ones. And we'll have the opportunity to see exactly how that works. Uh, and you have a number of sources. So these are people that you know who have access to information that you don't know yourself, which is a way to have different kinds of interactions with me that are not necessarily related to the case. Well, they're related to the case, but these are all friendly people and they fill up like all the all the investigative ability that you, you and abilities that you do not have are filled in by your sources. So you know a scientist, Virginia Ashbury, you know a fortune teller who's Madame Eva, you know a shrink who's Dr. Jeff Mac McIntosh, who's also doubles up as a doctor if ever you need patching up and you don't want to go to the hospital for some reason. Uh, you know a professor who know, has a lot of other academic uh, background that you do not have. And a production designer, this being LA, uh, you got to have access to some kind of access to Hollywood, and this is it. Uh, and your uh, private detective, you the, the game system functions in a way that when you have a challenge that you fit, when you succeed at a challenge, that's an advance, and that gives you a specific edge that you can use in a beneficial way later. But when you fail it, it'll give you a problem that makes your case more complicated and more interesting in twisted ways that usually don't necessarily go well with, for your character, but that makes it interesting at the same time. So you're going to start with one problem. And uh, the problems are titled, What Killed the Cat, Lonely, Broke, or You're a Vice Hound. 
and I'll let you read them and uh, you might be able to see on screen, but we don't necessarily, it'll, the title gives you an idea and we'll read you, I'll let you read the one that you choose. And this is a little bit of the beginning of personalizing your, your Dexter, like who is your private detective? Because it's a bit of a blank page on purpose. And I'll ask you a few questions so that you can either draw on that blank page as you're feeling inspired, or you could just leave it as a mystery because sometimes, you know, the biggest mystery this PI is going to deal with is himself. I mean, I'm just going to go for it. I'm a vice hound. Perfect. Do you want to read the card? Yeah. Uh, gambling whores, the opium pike. You've kicked all those vices before. So if you slip a bit and indulge one or more of your compulsions, you can straighten yourself up again, right? Right? Perfect. All right. So we'll get rid of the other ones and you have the vice hound. And then you have, just so everybody knows, you have what's called pushes. And pushes are four tokens, basically. You have uh, four opportunities to uh, use what's called a push. And a push is something that you would get over and above the normal information and clues that you get. So let's say that you're talking to somebody, he's giving you some information, but you would like this person to do something that they would not normally do then you would have to use a push for that. And I would give you an opportunity and tell you exactly what's gonna happen. All right, I'll stop sharing my screen and go back to normal video, but we have access to that. Okay, so uh, are you feeling a little bit inspired to give your uh, private detective a little bit of um, background? Think I'll ask so? you a question. So I'll, yes, I'll ask yeah. you a couple of questions. I'm not going to make things very, very complicated, right? So uh, yep. we will start. Funny enough, I looked. And in 1937, the May calendar is the same as uh, this year. So we're going to start our story on a uh, morning of Wednesday, 12th of May, 1937. That's cool. And we're about mid to late morning, something like that. And uh, you, Dex Raymond, are in your uh, your office, uh, which is in the area of Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is kind of the down and out area of 1937 Los Angeles. Uh, it used to be where the very rich uh, landowners and uh, cattle ranchers of the city used to live in the turn of the century. But all of that kind of changed. This is an area that doesn't, I mean, it actually doesn't really exist as it is at all. It was completely raised, but completely just like destroyed by real estate developers um, just shortly after. But at that particular time, the, that neighborhood has a few short, um, like low buildings, a lot of old large houses that have been split out into apartments. It's a little bit run down. There's a funicular uh, like up down train that allows people to go to ferry up and down. And there's a lot of working class type people, a few offices. Uh, and so this is where your office is as your private detector office. Kind of like traditional frosted glass entry saying pre presumably private detective, unless you have an idea of what you'd like it to say on the frosted glass. You know, I feel like because he has gone out on his own, he's operating on the fringes. He's maybe not advertising himself that much. So I'm going to say his name is probably not on the door. Maybe it just says PI. Okay, great. And uh, do you have an idea why uh, Dex Raymond got into the PI business? Was he like a policeman before? Was he in the military or nothing to do with any of that or... No, I think that he uh, grew up in a pretty poor area and he saw a lot of systemic corruption that impacted his hardworking parents. And so I think he felt compelled to uh, take on the wrongdoings in the world. Uh, but he's not, uh, he's not that friendly and happy of a person. So he's kind of a lone wolf and is doing this to basically avenge his childhood. Got it. Is he, uh, what kind of age is he? See, he's in his late fifties. Late fifties. Okay. Right. He's really been around the block. He's been doing this for a long time. He's kind of, he's hardened. Yeah, yeah. He's been doing this a long time. He probably looks younger than he is. He's a bit of a ladies man, uh, despite the smoking and drinking. So he probably looks in his 40s, but he's got a lot of experience under his belt. 
Do you have a, given the vice hound thing, obviously you will indulge in whatever, but do you have a favorite particular vice that you indulge in a lot? Is it drugs, alcohol, women gambling? Yeah, cocaine was a big problem for him, especially living in LA, being around Hollywood types, trying to chase that glitz and glam, that uh, cocaine is a, is a real problem for him. Got it, cool. And Got drinking, but he and doesn't drinking. recognize that the drinking is an issue. No, absolutely not. Well, I wanted to mention, I forgot this, just uh, a quick parenthesis. I wanted to get into it, but it's not a bad time to get into it. Uh, it's it's going to be pretty much one of the first times I actually published something uh, of playing a game. And this is also something I wanted to talk about uh, because it was just like in a general interest in promoting them, which is usually called the uh, emotional security tools. And we already just, I also made me think about it because we just mentioned a couple of, well, technically what we might call adult themes, like uh, such as uh, addiction, for example. And uh, uh, there's a lot of role-playing game tables where it's important to talk about emotional security to be able to make sure that we're keeping the experience fun. And we're not talking about something that is gonna upset anybody. And for the purpose of anybody watching or listening to this later, that you would know what we're getting into so that you have an idea whether you want to get into it or let's keep listening or not as well. Uh, and there's a couple of different ones, uh, ones that are very traditionally used uh, and that I do use regularly. Uh, and I would rather mention this, even though sometimes for some tables, it can be awkward, mention it once and never have to use it again, rather than things being awkward or a bad experience for anybody. Uh, and the one, one of them is called the X card. The X card, which is usually much easier to use when we're around a table, because the idea of the X card, just to uh, explain to that, is if we're around a table, you would have a card or a paper with a big X on it. And if anybody feels uncomfortable about whatever is going on, they would just touch it and we could just smooth over and move over to the next thing. Uh, in our case, you're just going to go like this, just like give me a symbol so, or wave <laughs> so that I have an idea. And then there's another one, which is a little bit more um, slightly, well, just a little bit more different, but it's quite easy. The idea called lines and veils. I don't know if you heard about that one before. Uh, yeah. So it's an idea coined around the environment of indie role-playing games by a dude called, it was coined by him, but I don't know if he invented it, Ron Edwards, I think. But anyway, the idea being that there are topics that are hard lines and those topics, <clears throat> because of the fact that they're lines, just do not belong in our gaming experience. For whatever reason, you don't need to explain anything. Uh, like to and to give us an example, one that I usually have at my games, and uh, and it's it's just like to talk about sexual violence or sexual assault in any kind of way, that yep. is just like does not belong in any other games. We won't talk yeah. about it. There's no reason to. That's it. Uh, but it's also very useful for anybody who might have any kind of phobia or uncomfortable anything uh, to mention that. And then the other one, which is veils. Veils are things that may well be mentioned but we don't need to go into detail, we'll just pass over. So one that is a typical one that I use uh, is sex. Like maybe because of the adult theme of the film noir, there might be, that there's a lot more chances of there being betrayals, maybe a passionate kiss, maybe something like that. But there's also not much reason to go into more detail than just saying it's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so just in case, I don't know if there's anything that you, that I might not know about. Like, I think it might be as silly as, not silly, because if it's the case, it's not silly, but if you have a phobia of spiders, then you can put a line on it. And I'm like, all right, great. I'm never going to mention spiders because it's not necessary to the story anyway. Is there anything the, you wanted to add or? That was perfect for me. Uh, sexual violence against women is often used as a plot device uh, in film and television. And I really appreciate that we will not be uh, stooping to that level. So that's great. Yeah. And then the rest of it, as we mentioned just before, as I mentioned just before, we're going very much in the genre of film noir. So there might, there's going to be, you know, all of all of whatever you find in a film noir movie is going to be may well happen. That's it. Yeah, and I would say that the vices, in my mind, are more internal struggles the character is going to come up against, as opposed to me pretending to play an addict. Absolutely, uh, and and caricature, caricature, caricaturing. Absolutely. That. Yes, absolutely. And and yeah. just and this is something that, that is worth mentioning and definitely important for anything to do with role playing games, that we're not not in any case, way, shape or form intending to alleviate or eliminate or reduce or the, the difficulty that those situations may well be. Um, and we're not we're not pretending this is a way this is how it is, but so we're just kind of like playing and interpreting a role. 
in the mm -hmm. same way I was going to say, also that's another one, because I'm going to be interpreting a lot of different characters. I usually am very bad at accents, so I'm going to, I'm going to not, <laughs> I'm going to try to avoid doing accents altogether. I'd love to do, take a lot of like mobster 1930s accents. And I'm sure at some point, because I'll get into it, I will. So if I do any kind of accents that I get into that are just horrible for you, I apologize in advance. And I don't mean to be um, uh, either uh, just upsetting to anybody, basically. I'm just you know, having fun with it. <laughs> it's just like, if you're, like, if you're shocked by any of my accents, just put it on the fact that I have poor accents. And because I get into it, I'll play the characters. <laughs> Cool. I think we've just done, we've covered most of the caveats. And uh, so mm -hmm. uh, responsibility waivers are assigned by anybody who's keep, who keeps listening and watching. And we're going to place you back at your, your dingy little office uh, in uh, Bunker Hill. Uh, you're at your desk. Uh, and how about um, one thing? So, you, you know, you have typical stuff for, that you would find in a, in a private detective's office, you have a wooden desk, quite basic, you're sat in your chair. Is it, uh, what, what, how, how does it look like? Is it like either very clean or very orderly, very messy, very sparse, very, what's the general quite sparse. Okay. It's quite sparse. Uh, I don't tend to keep a lot of records. Uh, once I'm done with the case, uh, I'm done with it, I move on. I'm not looking for things to come back and haunt me. And what's uh, so, one thing that is uh, that you see, that is in your office that is particularly special, different, or valuable to you as your character? Uh, two things. I have a crystal decanter that I keep my whiskey in that belonged to my father. Right. Uh, and so when that's a you know I have some rituals around uh, my relationship to that decanter. Is it filled uh, usually with? What kind of uh, liquor is it usually filled with? Rye, whiskey, uh, bourbon, something else? It's a bourbon. I'm a bourbon drinker. Right. I like the sweet smoke. Perfect. Also, I feel like ladies kind of are, can enjoy a bourbon. So it, it gives me that double application. Uh, and then I also have an old rickety desk lamp that has one of those like, ying, those little buzzing sounds from the light, but I just can't bring myself to get a new one. It's come with me to every office, everywhere I go. Uh, it's my it's my thinking light. Perfect. So when I'm digging into the details, that's the light that I put on. Great. Well, as you're doing um, whatever you're doing right now, I don't know if you're you're, you're at your desk, and uh, a knock is a knock on the door. Hello. And you can see the silhouette there? of what looks like a woman opens the door. And this gorgeous woman uh, is slightly backlit for some reason. This, like, your office is slightly darker. And you can see her walk into the office. And she walks in with a very assured, just extremely confident air. She has a beautiful, uh, slim dress that is dark green with a kind of like white, very large bow that's against her um, uh, her, uh, her uh, chest. Uh, a slight hat, a flat hat beret type over the side of her uh, head. And it's also green, that one. Green with a little bit of a red border on it. Uh, she has mid-length kind of like hazel hair. Just very classy, very classy woman clearly, uh, and has, is holding a little, um, a, a small handbag, walks in uh, quite confidently. Are you Dexter, Mr. Dexter Raymond, the private investigator? What's it to you? Well, I'm hoping that I'll be able to hire you for a case. Unfortunately, my, may I have a seat? Yes, I, I kick out a chair with my foot. I'm a little hesitant of the wealthy dame who came dressed up to see me. She might be trying to pull a fast one on me. So I'm a little hesitant, but I kick out a chair. Yeah. She looks around kind of like looking like clearly she's out of place. Uh, and uh, while you know that, you can see that very clearly. She's looking like, you know, she's certainly not going to have a look of disgust on her face. But if there's anything to her eyes, you wonder if that's kind of like that, which may well amuse you possibly. Anyway, she takes a seat uh, and goes, uh, 
Mr. Raymond, I've been recommended, uh, you've been highly recommended to me while I asked around and uh, I, I'm hoping you can help us. I'm hoping you help me and help my family and really, you'd place her maybe like late twenties probably, you'd say something like that. Uh, sharp cookie, you'd, after a few minutes, you kind of imagine that, but my sister, it's, it's about my sister. Something's happened to her and uh, I, I'm, at, I'm at a loss and the police like have dropped the investigation. They're not doing anything. And clearly if there was anything that would happen to our family, I'd rather be in the hands of like us and someone, you know, obviously private like you, than uh, something that could be picked up by the broadsheets, the news and all the bad reputation that might come from it. I, I apologize. I, I'm losing all my manners. I forget everything. I, my name is Deacon, Margaret Deacon. And you Hello, recognize Margaret. from the name, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, let's, let's have the, have the conversation play out a tiny bit. Sorry, I missed what you said. Hello, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, who told you uh, about me? How did you get my, inf how did you come to get my information? Well, you have a certain amount of reputation. I asked around, I checked in with uh, a few people I know and uh, a couple of people, a couple of my employees uh, was also corroborated by somebody who works for my lawyer. Uh, and the word around town is, if you want a job done and you want it done well to the end, you're the man, apparently. That's what I've been told. Um, and uh, sorry, just checking all my stuff. Um, Yeah, word on the street is you don't back down. And also, you have one of the rare qualities of the people of your kind and all the shamanses in town is apparently you don't get bribed and you don't get corrupted. And mm -hmm. I've also heard that you never drop a case once you've committed to it. And that's the kind of person I'm looking for. And I think this is a this is a tough one. So I need somebody, somebody who's going to take it to the end. Well, Margaret, before I commit to anything, I need to understand more about the case and what happened to your sister. Of course. Can I offer you a drink? Sure, of course. I can. I will happily have a drink. Cheers. Cheers. She settles in her seat, relaxes a tiny bit. What can I tell you? What do you want to know? What do you need to get started? Well, I always say that we got to start at the beginning to have a start. Tell she me sighs. about your sister. Oh, my sister, Helen. Helen Deacon. Helen's always been, the, um, I would say, a little bit more the wild one of the two of us. Sweet, sweet, sweet Helen. She gets into her messes. I mean, anyhow. Six weeks ago, it was, she went missing. Six weeks ago, she went missing. And, you know, I'm busy with the firm. And this is where you, once she's talking a little bit more about her family and a tiny bit about her job, you kind of put two and two together of the, the, the last name Deacon. And uh, you recognize that it is a quite known, up, like quite known established family in Los Angeles who are big real estate developers. Uh, and from what she's describing, it sounds like she's managing uh, or some either the business or it has a high position within it somehow. Um, she went missing. And uh, at first, we didn't get worried. As I said, like she would, you know, go out about town and uh, she a little bit following in our father's footstep was a little bit more of the wild one. And uh, at first, didn't see her for a couple of days. It would very well could happen. She might have gone for with a guy over to Malibu or something, you know go figure. But after a few more days, like close to a week, I started getting really worried and I called the cops. Uh, so we put out a missing person. They apparently supposedly went out looking for her, but I don't really think they did anything, frankly. You know how the police is like. And, uh, and then a week later, so that's just four weeks ago, she just turned up. She turned up wandering the downtown streets, or at least that's what I've been told by the police who brought her back. Uh, late at night, she had was wearing only a, a dirty camisole and slip that was like half just restraining her, uh, but she had a, a alarm left out when the police brought her over. 
uh, covered in uh, with, with a few blood stains and uh, and just stains and dirt. It was just gross, to be honest. Apparently, the cops picked her up in the middle of the night and they recognized her from the missing person thing, and they brought her back home, thinking that you know they they didn't want to cause any scandals and uh, and well, right they were on that one. I got to give them that. Uh, discreetly took her home and, uh, and 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 when she got home, she didn't seem to recognize me. She's just like in this. <sighs> And she, you can see she's genuinely like worried, uh, uh, and she's generally feeling it. Catatonic says she could like, oh, she's been mute and catatonic ever since. Just kind of like, I, I gave her. We we looked at to giving her the best care money could buy. She's seen psychologists and seen doctors. Uh, she's got like twenty four hour nursing, and and I was hoping that she would get better. I, I was really hoping that she would get better, but it's not changing anything. It's just she's not moving and. Uh, I don't, I'm at a loss. I don't know what happened to her. I'm afraid some, someone did this to her. That's what I want to find out. And that's why I've come to you. I, I, I did, I, now, I, honestly, it's just a hunch, but it's just so weird. Nothing, something doesn't add up. Something doesn't add up. Is there and anyone this, you can think? Huh? So wait, Is there wait, anyone this, you can think? Oh, yeah. On this, she, she pulls a cigarette out. She offers you a cigarette. Uh, and she's kind of like leaning over and looks at you in the eyes and it seems to be waiting for a light. Oh, I pull out. Uh, I have an old brass Zippo that I keep in my breast pocket that I pull out just for this occasion. I myself don't smoke cigarettes that much, more cigars, but I'll take one for the pretty lady. Great. And as you, as you, as she's bending, she's leaning over and you're lighting her cigarette and she looks at you in the eyes and you can see the beautiful kind of like dark blue color of her eyes. And at that moment, we have our first challenge. Uh, so we're going to have a challenge and uh, so that I'm going to be able to explain how that goes. And challenges are dealt with. Uh, so these are things that you can succeed or fail. And uh, in this case, are you going to get smitten with Margaret? Uh, uh, are you going to fall for her lovely uh, charms? <laughs> and uh, despite the age played, difference, we'll just ignore the age difference. We'll just let that go. Exactly. Uh, the um, so this is played with no regular d sixes. So a regular d six is a regular mm -hmm. die, and you have a number of different skills that are listed on your character sheet. And mm -hmm. this skill is. Uh, this challenge is called keeping it professional with Margaret. And uh, you can have three different results. And this skill is, is cool. It's uh, this cool skill is trying to keep it cool under pressure and doing the right thing rather than uh, acting on impulse. Okay. Uh, and you have, so you usually have one or two dies for your skills. Which, what, which one is this one? Do you see? Uh, cool has one die. Exactly. So do I have to do cool? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's determined. Okay, yeah. got it. So this one is an area where you don't have a choice. This is what it is. Uh, okay. But where you do have choice is, so there's three different things that can happen out of a challenge. You can have what's called an advance. That's the best result. That's the success, if you will. You can have a hold. Hold is a middling success. Typically, you know, you're left no worse or no better than before. Right. Or you can have a <laughs> setback. A setback is where you, have, you create a problem for yourself and something happens. <laughs> Uh, and you, the way that it works is I tell you what you need to, in order to reach an advance, but I don't tell you what you need, what, how much is the setback. So if this challenge is, a, is four. So with your six sided die, you would have to get four to have an advance. You, okay. all, you have an option if you would like to get an extra problem uh, to throw another dice, but you don't have to decide now. What happens is you just throw your one dice and based on the results, you can decide whether you want to get an extra problem and throw an extra dice to try to get to the number four or not. Okay. And we're just going to trust that I'm not going to lie about my problem. Yeah, we're just going to trust that. I just, <laughs> exactly. And it's just the one die. All right, here we go. Oh, hey, mm -hmm. Max six. Max six, congratulations. Well, you're grizzles. You've seen you've seen things before. You've seen this kind of setup before. 
You don't like, you know, can't teach a, what's the saying again? <laughs> old dog, new tricks. You can't teach old dog, new tricks. Exactly. You can totally see, however, how a hundred guys would totally fall in love with a woman this glamorous and start than smart. Fortunately for you, you're not one of those guys. And you gain a new edge and the new edge is called self-possessed. And this is something that you will be able to use later. I'm going to put it to number, number one. Um, so I will put that over here. And this new edge says, a show of self-control gives you the confidence you'll need if this case gets hairy. And it allows you to spend an extra die on a cool or stability challenge in the future. Or uh, use it for a plus two bonus on any general or mental test. So it's an advantage that you can use at some other later point. And you can use it one time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can use it one time. Great. Uh, sorry, so you were asking? Yeah, you said the cops picked her up and took her home. Where'd they pick her up? Oh, uh, they picked her up in uh, downtown Hollywood, uh, downtown LA. It's a pretty big area. Yeah, sorry, I'll tell you, I'll give you an exact address. All right, middle of the night uh, at six and Olive Street. Six and Olive. Did you hang around that area much? Not at all, no, 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 not at all, I mean. Oh, did she? No, 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 not as far, not as far as I know, or, or at least not as far as I know. Where was she like to hang out? What are your fa sister's favorite haunts? Uh, well, her favorite haunts were, um, let me see. Honestly, I don't really know. I'm so busy with the, uh, so busy with the firm mm -hmm. that I, I can't keep up with her goings or, or comings and goings. I know that she she regularly hangs out in some, some of the rug joints that are the fancy gambling dens, uh, not dens, mm -hmm. but fancy gambling kind of like casino types. Uh, there's a place called Chateau Marmont at the bar over there. And there's this dude um, that's one of the guys that she's been seeing that I know of called Marshall Daly. He's a, one of those Hollywood types, just, you know, fancies himself as a movie star, but really is just kind of like, you know, he works in there, but. Uh, but I think he lives over at that spot. And um, uh, sorry. Are you close no. with your sister? Uh, it's a screenwriter for Capital Pictures. I only met him a few times. It uh, seems like the handsome, angry, probably the jealous type, you know? You close with your sister, Margaret? I wouldn't call us extremely close. I mean, we were, really, we were. But I think, sadly, when our mom died, our mother passed, uh, it's kind of drawn a wedge. Even at the time, she was very sick. Uh, and sadly, uh, I mean, what kind of what happened was that... Um, sorry. Uh, do, 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 where is that? Oh, yeah. Um, Helen started talking, she, once she started talking all that nonsense and she talked about auras and secret masters and the power of pyramids and I just, she was hoping to save her, I believe, but I, 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 to be fair, I never really approved her waywardness. I mean, I, she even tried to drag me into that nonsense about like occult seances and the only thing I remember from that is she used to say the, the, something about argent lights on a regular basis. I don't know what it was, to be honest. And as I said, I just, I stopped, I stopped, I mean, sadly, after our mother passed and I was just busy, once our father retired from the business, there was so much to handle and to take care of. And I just didn't really, I thought she should quiet down her partying and drinking and hanging out with the, you know, gambling and Hollywood types and just nothing good comes out of it. So, which is also why I was not surprised when she disappeared at first, but Ultimately, I think whatever happens, it's got to be bigger than that. I mean, she was, yes, she was a little bit irresponsible, but not, I, I can't, I mean, maybe she got herself mixed up in something bad, which is also why I'm asking. Had she disappeared before? Uh, for a couple of days here and there for a long weekend, but not, not for that long. And certainly I've never, I mean, 
I've never seen her in the state she's in now. I, and I really hope she would get better, but she hasn't at all. How do you describe the state? It's a, it's a memory loss. Anything else happening? She, she, she's, she's in a state where she's has looks terrified constantly. She's barely sleeping. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and on a break, and she's just catatonic staying there, not moving, uh, completely just no reaction to anything. She didn't seem to recognize me. She still doesn't. Or occasionally she might throw just a, a huge fit and go into a, a state of complete rage and terror. And I, and I don't know what's driving her. And I, I don't know at all. I just, uh, I don't know. She got any enemies? I mean, she, she was juggling a few different men. It could have been someone jealous, but, but I don't see what they would have done to her. I, I don't understand. Uh, and well, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. What about the Deacon family? I mean, you're a well-known family. Surely there are people who have issues with you. Perhaps, I mean, I, but I can't, how would I pinpoint any relationship with Helen? I, I just, I can't begin to think about it. That's the, uh, I don't see anything in our day-to-day -day operations that she, she has no handling of any of it. And even if somebody was trying to get back at me, why would, why do it that way? I don't, I don't know what it would be related to at all. I'll ask the questions. So sure, any business sure. dealings? Course, 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 Mr. Raymond. I'm sorry? Any business dealings that went awry in recent? No. I mean, hmm. aside from like, you know, passing over, but they didn't go awry at all. They went fine. Uh, on When my dad retired, our father retired. Uh, but aside from that, no, it's just, uh, I took over and that was already years ago, just after our mom passed actually. How did your mother pass? Cancer, unfortunately. Tell me more about this uh, relationship she has with the occult and that funny business. Oh, I have no idea. As I said, like she told me to come to a meeting to meet someone one day. I had no interest in this. No interest whatsoever. This, um, I don't know, Argent Light was this only thing that I remember hearing about. I don't um, know, really, just to, to know. Do you recall who you were meant to meet? Oh, no, no. She wanted to introduce me to who I don't know if it was like the club members of their seance inspiring voodoo. Th I don't know. It's really not my scene at all. I'm, I'm way too pragmatic for that. And I, I don't, it was very saddened that my sister got lost into, frankly, what I believe are char charlatans who just wear after our money, let's be honest. Who do you think might be after your money? Oh, I don't mean my money. I meant the people who were like spiritual advisors and the like, and that's mm -hmm. what I meant. Mm -hmm. Oh, after my money? I don't, I mean, we're just like, we've got a new property deal that we're looking at at the moment and uh, renovating and building a business in Pasadena. We've got a couple of other interests in the, lower, in the area of Santa Monica and downtown Hollywood, but just, this is just usual business dealings, not anything that Helen would, care about as i said or that he was just not involved at all you said the cops didn't do much do you know what they did do who they did speak to no i mean let's be honest the cops are useless in this town you know it as well as i do they're corrupted but i mean there is the added advantage of of course um well no I, I, so they said that they ran an investigation and talked to some, some people i don't know what they did I did not insist because I would rather, if there was anything scandalous that Helen got into, I'd rather be able to keep a hold on things and to interact directly with somebody that I hire, which would be you, Mr. Raymond. You know, if you spoke with Ted Gargan at all, was he on the case? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Well, I mean, you don't have a lot for me to go on, but I'm intrigued. I'm curious what happened to your sister in those two weeks she's been back and doesn't seem to have her memory and wits about her. Certainly sounds concerning. And what kind of compensation are you offering to take on this job? Whatever your usual rates are, Mr. Raymond, you name the price. Mm -hmm. 
can have a contract sent over to you. All right. I'm happy. I'm willing to take this on. Where can I get in touch with you? In oh, case you can I get have in any touch questions. with me either at the at our office or uh, find us at the Family Manor. The Deacon Manor uh, is in a uh, where I live with uh, my sister and my father and our servants. So she gives you the address of both the office location and her house. If you need anything, of course, and here's the phone number. Don't hesitate to come around if you need uh, anything, and I'd love to be kept in touch with the the progress of whatever you find out. I'll be in touch in the next few days, Margaret. Thank you. And see, great, she takes off. Cool. Uh, given time, do you feel up for doing another one or should we chat? Well, I would like to make some phone calls. Great. Am I, allow am I allowed to do that? No, you're allowed to do that. I was saying that out of game. I was just looking oh. at the clock. <laughs> I could do I could do a little bit more. I agree. Because I would like to call my friend Max Weil and see if he knows. I mean, he's in the movie industry. I want to see if he knows anything about this Marshall Daily boyfriend. Right. So yeah, you pick up the phone and uh, it rings a couple of times. And you kind of get a sleepy hello. Uh, with a slight German accent, Max coming from Germany, who is your, do you want to actually say who Max is? You don't have Max's of information, but just uh, just so that people know, if ever they're listening or watching. Oh, I can, Max I'm happy is to tell uh, you otherwise. Yeah, I mean, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for a long time. You know, we're cut from a different cloth. He's in the art world. He likes to talk about movies and that kind of thing. Uh, he knows a lot about art history and, and architecture and all that kind of stuff. And he's a, he's a production designer. So, you know, he's in the, he's in the Hollywood fray. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as being in the Hollywood fray, mid-morning is a bit early for him. <laughs> Depending, Absolutely. If he's, obviously, if he's shooting, then he'll be up at dawn. But it really depends. Max is not a slouch, but it might depend. He might have had a late night. Anyway, hello. You can hear. Uh, so he comes from Germany and moved over from Germany for obvious reasons as a uh, as a Jewish person uh, in the in 1933 after Kristallnacht. And uh, yeah, he answers the phone. Oh, Dex, is that you? Hi, Max. How you doing? I have, I have a very, very late night scouting for locations. It just, what time is it? Oh, it's mid morning. I'll keep this quick. I won't, I won't keep you long. Right, right, right. I've got okay. this what do you need? funny case for this deacon dame. Said her sister's dating this guy, Marshall Daly. He seems to be a screenwriter for Capital Pictures. You know him? Uh, Marshall Daly. Yeah, yeah, I know him. I'm, I mean, I know him. I know of him. I've seen him at a couple of parties. He's occasionally come to, he's even come to a couple of the parties that I threw actually, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know who he is. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. So beautiful, just gorgeous actually. That kind of wake, seems to wake him up a little bit. Uh, you ever met his girlfriend? His girlfriend, oh, he has a girlfriend? I mean, I've seen him mm -hmm. with a different woman every time. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's a bit of that kind of type, you know? Little bit of a pretty boy, he's got a job. He works for Capital, if I remember correctly, Capital Pictures. Um, good guy, I, I mean, he's got good intentions. He could, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as saying that he's a slouch, but I think that if you really put his mind to it, he could produce amazing screenplays, but I think he just does enough and likes the party and the lifestyle a lot, you know? Where would I get a hold of him? Uh, you can, well, typewriter alley, I mean, the, uh, probably not for a couple of hours, but we, if I, if I remember correctly, you live at Chateau Marmont, which is a, so you know that Chateau Marmont is a, is a hotel slash kind of, it has suites with people living in them and quite a few people from the picture industry live in those places and it has a bulk, uh, like a, uh, a really nice bar with a lot of people hang out at night, nice restaurants, etc. Uh, so he's like, well, you could either catch him there or obviously at the the typewriter alley at Capital Pictures, which is uh, 
where all the type, all the screenwriters work together. So it's like a low, it's, you know, it's a little bit off from where the actual studios are, but it's still part of the same uh, area around there, close to Hollywood. So there's a lot of the, all the screen, screenwriters work in different, there's an office set for them, I believe. You should be able to find them either here, here, there or, yeah, quite easily. Ever heard anything about them that doesn't sit quite right? Um, good question. Let me check. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, Uh, no, I mean, he's a good kid, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time. Cool. Hangs up. I call Madam Eva, my fortune teller source next. She assists me with information time from time to time. Knows a lot about cult, spiritualism and hermetic magic. Yeah. And Madam, Madam Irma, uh, well, um, is it Eva, Eva or Irma? What's her Eva, name? Madam Eva, Eva. Sorry, Madam Eva. She's a good person. You like her and she, you like also her type because she's a, uh, I mean, she's really into that world, but she's a little bit no nonsense. Uh, as in she, she knows that a lot of those kinds of people are fleecing the unsuspecting. Uh, and which, but you also know that she would never do that to somebody who doesn't really have the money. Yep. So, and, and you also, from what you know, whether this, whether you believe in this stuff, whether you believe it to be true or real or not, but anything to do with supernatural stuff, you do know that uh, she could easily give most psychologists to run for their money in terms of like solace and guidance and counseling. Uh, but that if anybody does really have way too much money, she'll definitely keep it. But she also looks after and takes care of the people in the neighborhood who actually need her advice and her counsel. She's a good person. So she charged me on the clock? No, if you have like a favor, like you exchange okay. favors, you know you know each other well enough that you, if you ask for information, if it doesn't cost her much, she'll give it to you. And uh, well, actually here's a question, like did you, what favor did you do for her in the past? Well, you know, I mean, it, she's in a tricky business. Not everybody, you know, buys into uh, what she says she has to offer. And sometimes people don't take her advice in the way that it was intentioned. She's had a few people kind of come back after her. Uh, and I've always stepped in on, on her behalf to uh, to keep her safe and keep her reputation where it should be uh, for those who, you know, uh, choose to do her harm. Perfect. Uh, all right, cool. So do you call her? Is that it? Yeah. I mean, how far away is she from me? She's not that far. <laughs> and she's it's got the morning. whole flamboyance. She's set up in uh, Hollywood Boulevard, like steps away from uh, from Musso, Frank and Grill and the Groundman's Egyptian Theater, which is further down Hollywood Boulevard from the Chinese Theater. That used to, The Egyptian Theater used to be the place where all the premieres happened until it was replaced by the newer and bigger uh, Chinese theater. Uh, I'm actually going to go and see her. I'm going to get outside. I've got a new case happening. I need to clear my head a little bit. I had a bit too much to drink last night. Uh, so I'm actually going to walk over uh, to see my friend. And sometimes LA is not so much of a Eva, walking city, though. <laughs> that's true. I have to drive. I have to take a cab. When take I said not far, I'm <laughs> that's fair uh yeah but i also there's something about seeing eva face to face sometimes you can catch things yeah. in her eyes that she's not quite saying yeah absolutely it's true so i'm uh, i'm gonna hail a cab uh you have a car do i yes okay. well, operating in la without a car is just like unworkable that's true unless All you right. were like for whatever reason broke but you have a car you have a okay. regular Ford of uh, of whatever common workhorse car. Is. Well, yes, I mean I do stakeouts, so I do need a car. <laughs> exactly. Great. Okay. And Driving you head over, over to see. Yeah, you head over to Madame Eva's, uh, and uh, you know we're around lunchtime ish at this by this point. Um, and uh, as I said, yeah. So her storefront, she's got a storefront, business hours, which is where you can find her. 
it's a palm reading joint. So the on the Hollywood, just straight onto the boulevard. It's got it's not it's not very big, but uh, it's you know it's got a nice storefront with uh, drapes in front, and it's quite like uh, esoteric symbols. It says Madame Eva Fortune Teller. Um, and that's about it. She's got. So you walk in, presumably. Anything you want to do in particular as you walk out of the car or get over there, or? Uh, you know, usually, just as my nature, I always look around, see if there's anything that catches my eye in the area. It's just a habit of being a PI, really. But on yeah. occasion, I've caught something that uh, ended up being useful down the road. I take a good 360 scan before walking in. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary. It's a it's a beautiful spring day. A couple of clouds in the sky. Uh, the weather's nice. It's midday. There are people that are just like hurrying about for lunch. Traffic is kind of regular for this midday in the week. Um, yeah, midweek. And uh, I, yeah. I did notice a coffee shop next door. I'm going to grab two coffees. Uh, yeah. Bring a coffee to, to Eva. Perfect. So you grab the coffee and you know how she likes it. So uh, you got the coffee the way she likes it from the that diner coffee joint just next door. And uh, you walk in uh, and uh, you just wait. You have to wait a tiny bit until one of the customers walks out. <clears throat> and a customer walks out and she walks out of the, the kind of like office business area versus the waiting room where you are, where you walk in, which is kind of the lobby slash waiting room. Uh, which is de quite lushly uh, decorated uh, with, you know, you have drapes through the window, so it's going to be, the lights are a lot dimmer than the bright, sunny light from the outside uh, Hollywood. They are, are um, just, there's a model pyramid on a small table in the middle of the room. There are magazines about uh, just supernatural stuff. There are astrological charts on the walls. There's a lunar calendar on another wall. Were you thinking something? Yeah. And uh, she walks out and Madame Eve is, uh, she's, she's her usual flamboyant self. She's got a beautiful dress and a headscarf, uh, quite heavy set makeup, colorful. Uh, and she owns it and she plays it and she plays acts it pretty well. And she knows, uh, you know, she's quite grandiloquent. She's uh, outspoken, speaks quite loud, a little bit of a deep voice, dark hair, uh, a little bit of dark eyeliner. And uh, theatrically, she says, well, she bids goodbye to the customer, which is a, a slightly uh, like middle-aged, fancy looking woman. And uh, she goes, oh, Mr. Raymond, such a pleasure to see you hang around these fancy parts. What can I do for? And, and she addresses there's a couple of people waiting in the waiting room. Is this going to take long? Yeah, it might. To you, she says that. It might. Yeah, I mean, it might, but I, I I, can make it quick. Okay, we could take a couple of minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. I, like, or just re I apologize, like what she says. So, takes you over into the back, uh, into her back room, which is currently on. She has a table with a nice cloth over it. There's a crystal ball, uh, beautiful set chairs. Uh, you notice when you, I don't know if you sit, actually, do you sit? You don't have to. I'm she doesn't leaning, sit down. I can lean like, against the wall. She, we're short on time. I'm leaning against right, the wall. Cool. What do you need? What can I do you for? I don't want to take up too much of your time, Eva. I appreciate this. Uh, course, I've got a bit of, of a course. funny case. Uh, it was brought to me. Uh, what do you know about the Deacon family and their uh, connection to the occult? The Deacon family? Um, I, do, and I don't... Uh, usually she's you know, the You're like, real what? estate uh, developers. Well, all right, let me check one thing. Uh, well, I mean, I don't believe the Deacon family is particularly related to anything of the occult. Not that I know of. I don't think. I mean, the Deacon, are they the real estate people? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, one of the daughters, Helen's been in the paper lately. It seems that she disappeared for a few weeks and she's back now but they can't seem to figure out where she had been 
Oh, can't wait a see minute. to figure it Helen either. Deacon, that does ring a bell. I wonder, has she been hanging out with the likes of Clara Nebel? The have you heard of the Argent? Um, what's it called again? Uh, the Order of Argent Light. Yes, it's, that's right. The Order of Argent Light. I think that's. I think that's what I. Somebody told me one of my. Well, anyway, I can't really say that, but I, I believe she was mixed in with those types. Mixed in? What do you mean? What, what kind of well, type like are a member, these? I mean, I guess. Uh, the Order of Argent Light is this order, uh, mystical, I guess. They call themselves some kind of, uh, some kind of occult. They, they talk about, like, they, they do meetings. They talk about occult grandmasters who control the world. Uh, it's led by this woman called Clara Nebel. Uh, let me double check a couple of other things. Um, and uh, right, there you go. They're like, oh yeah, there's kind of like, I guess it's sort of a mix between mystical theosophists sprinkled with some kind of like paganist something religion. It's like semi-cultish religion, semi-just mystical, not exactly certain. Um, you said that they meet, where do they meet, do you know? Yeah, I believe their location at the, uh, um, uh, at her bungalow, at Clara's bungalow on Loma Linda Avenue. It's in Hollywood, actually, it's not very far. You know when they meet? I'm not sure they're. I'm sorry, no, I'm not sure of their exact meeting times, but I'm pretty sure you'd be able to find Clara over there. I, I believe she lives or spends most of her days there. She might live there, actually. Now that I think of it. No, if I wanted to get an invitation to one of these meetings, how would I do that? I do think they mix in a little bit with the, uh, you know, the hardcore cult, but a, a meeting to. I think you probably better to ask or I can get you I can find out when the meetings are if you want to go to a specific meeting yeah would you come with me usually Eva? I think members are corrupted I I'm not particularly a member I would be I mean I have enough reputation to show up over there but you can certainly I, as a side note I will tell you as the GM uh that's one of the elements that is given in the how to solve a case just in case you're just and your future thinking, in case you're thinking of disguising or going under false pretenses to meet somebody, to just be careful of what kind of false pretenses you want to get into when you start asking questions, because it limits you to the kind of question you want to ask. Right. Uh, or you are you can ask, depending. It doesn't mean, so you might find it, so it's just a warning against finding yourself in a situation where you go into false pretense and you ask a question that has nothing to do with your false pretense. And then you just like look kind of foolish because you're like, oh, well, actually, I'm a PR. Uh, but that's just I'm saying this, by the way. I was going to go under the pretense of being a professor who is studying supernatural practices. And I would yeah, like and this to is, this is, observe so you can, So feel free to if you'd like to. And I would say the genre usually is you go and ask questions because you are a private investigator. That's true. That's true. I just don't know if they would talk to me. Well, typically, if you think about the genre and sticking to it, everybody talks to you. Yeah, that's fair. That's true, too. I did make a, a fatal error, though, I realize. Did you? At the beginning. Yeah. I didn't get a picture of Helen. It's okay. You can get one later. Yep. Yeah. I realize I have no photo to there's share. No, there's, no, there's not really any fatal mistake unless you pick a card that says so. Uh, okay. because going back and forth, going to meet the client again, this is totally part of the trope. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, yeah, that's Columbo fair. Yeah. goes back and forth to ask questions to the originating <laughs> people, true. you know, all the time. <laughs> that's true. By the way. Okay. So I know that they go to Claire's bungalow. That's, uh, I know where that is, all right. Uh, I know, Madam Eva, uh, you're, you know, you have customers anxiously waiting for you. Uh I think I'll take my leave of you for now, but uh, I may be following up with you in the future. 
Yeah, yes, of course, of course. Come back anytime, no problem. And we should totally do lunch at some point, right? That'd be great. I think this one should be on me. I think you paid the last time. Perfect, absolutely. We should totally do. All right, great. Take care, yeah? Be careful not to get in to get mixed into anything just outwardly too dangerous, right? I mean, keep in touch, okay? You know me, I can't promise anything, but I'm not looking to die. All right, good. What's next? Well, do we want to have, are we chatting about the yeah. game as well? About then the game, probably, yeah, let's do that. I mean, I just want to make sure yeah. that we're, all right, so let's do that because it's a good time to wrap up. We've done a couple of scenes uh, or wrap up this session particularly and spend a few minutes talking about our, well, our experience and uh, this idea of mixing play and strategy together about our jobs and any kind of like, you know, reason for playing. But let's start with uh, your experience of the beginning of this, given it's your first time playing. Honestly, it's my yeah. first time uh, mastering this game in particular anyway, so. <laughs> It was fun. Good. That's I a good think, start. Yeah. And there's, there's, tr it's funny because you kind of do fall back on tropes a little bit, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to kind of get into the game uh, by giving you kind of this Dexter Raymond character, uh, which is easier than, you know, just creating a character from scratch because it gives you like a reference point. Yes. Um, but it's not so specific that you don't have some room to to kind of make him your own, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, because I find a lot of times playing these sorts of games, uh, especially when I first started playing D&D, &D, I often was so focused on trying to create the character in my mind mm -hmm. that you kind of miss out on engaging with the game. So it's nice that you're focused less on developing the character and more on using the character to progress the game further. Yeah, there's a lot of different, and one of the things that I do enjoy and the reasons that there's a lot of people that like talking about this stuff in terms of game design is that role-playing games to me, and I think it's, it's pretty, like a lot of people would agree, have uh, such a way and a huge range of ways of pl being played uh, that you could talk about this stuff forever. Whereas if you look at a board game, you play Scrabble, you don't necessarily need to like the people around the table. There's a race, there's a way that you play it. You can play around, you know, messing around the rules. However, role-playing games, there's a lot of different interpretations of how you play this game. So how does your group or the group that you tend to play with the most, how do they tend to play? Is it, are there a lot of character interpretation or is it a lot of spending time, uh, the, the tactical aspect of managing combat, for example, uh, or a bit of mix of both or... Well, we're big nerds, so we usually do a pretty combat-focused campaign, and then we'll switch to a more social campaign. We like to kind of balance them, balance them out, uh, and the more social campaigns tend to involve more like magic and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, but um, we have come to a point we've played together for long enough that RGM actually requires us to come in character. So I put on certain clothes, I do makeup, wow. we have voices, wow. there are um, That's pretty there are like on. talisman and things that we carry with us. I always have candles lit around me. What kind uh, of character do you play? So my, <laughs> my character right now is actually based off Daphne Guinness. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> who that is. Daphne sorry. Guinness. Who? She's the heiress to the Guinness uh, oh, fortune. Okay. She's okay. also an am amazing fashion person. And so my character is this like very wealthy, eccentric. Uh, he, I'm a human, but I am haunted by my past. I am haunted by the spirit world. And I uh, have an opium addiction. Okay. Uh, and so I'm sort of the person who pays for our team to get the supplies and I help them get through high society and get the secrets and info from high society to bring back to us as we go through uh, our campaign. Brilliant. But, uh, but yeah, no, we, we really go for it. 
Perfect. And then we That's play good. for about five or six hours at a time. That's it's very cool. I I don't play very often for five or six hours at a time anymore. Um, I may have mentioned that to. they're all a lot younger to. than me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're all like late twenties, early thirties. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm you know, like a lot of older role players, I we encounter the biggest challenge is scheduling. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> and really, we did not play that much pre-COVID. But with the Roll20 and the D&D Beyond and stuff, it's very easy to play uh, online together and still yeah, have it a lot very more... interactive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And so, all right, so how, what else did you experience and how else was this little short bit of playing? And, and I have a few different ideas to, to bounce off of, uh, but just let's check if there's anything else for you of how it was generally. What's, it's interesting because I found myself wanting to kind of cover off as many things as I could and as many angles as I could think of for and see if that gave me a bit of an in to maybe a, a specific uh, like train of thought to follow. Uh -huh. But I didn't find that I was getting that. You did uh, not. And I, no, and I think... Um, I think after you've played these a few times, you get a better sense of like the pace of like how much information do you need to collect right at the outset and how much yeah. will you trust will come to you yeah. as you engage in the game. So I think I felt a little bit of that tension. How much do I want to be like me thinking about the things I need to gather versus me just being in the scene, playing it as it plays out. And well, that's funny. It makes crossed. me think of a parallel to talk about our, our jobs, which is, how much do I need to find out from the client to try to get on with my work? And how much do I need to find out from research? And when do I know when I have enough information to actually start writing a strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which to me is typically, and I've been told this when I was trained, and, I tell the, and I'm telling this to students now that I'm teaching, that there's a point where you kind of have to make a call that you have enough information to get going. Yeah, uh, because you can always stay and look for more information, particularly now that we have the online uh, like access to everything online and anything. And there's a trust piece there. Do I trust that I know the types of information that are most important for decision making? Mm -hmm. And do I trust that if I get a few of that, I have enough context and enough sort of understanding on how games go? that I can figure my way through the game. Yeah. Ooh, and, the other uh, and, part, that, that, is... and that's a similar to, to strategy, especially yeah. if you uh, work in the same category over and over again. Yeah. Uh, what things are actually table stakes that you know to be true because of the category you're working in, because of the convention of the game that you're playing, because those parameters will always impact the outcome. Yes. And, and the other thing which is close to this particularly this kind of noir genre that has like a lot of conversational bits. Uh, well, and, and, and role-playing games are a conversation overall. That's just all it is, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are mechanics and you roll dice. Yes, that's true. But uh, I was going to say that the, the gathering information is something that we may well do with internal teammates or directly with the client. And there's a whole, in, there is an interpersonal thing that is, okay, well, at what point are my questions no longer welcome? <laughs> At what point have I exhausted the information of this person, whether it's willing information or just, you know, just I'm now being insistent on something that there's no answer to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, a, that's not something that I've thought about very often, but I have experienced it for sure. And it's a very interesting dance in any kind of, particularly in any kind of business setting. And I don't think it's unique to strategists at all. Uh, to have a, a conversational, like a meeting where you're asking questions where we would want to know as much as possible about the business of the person that we need to work for uh, so that we can identify exactly what their challenges are, what their problems are, or like with the parallel, in the case like you're talking to your client as the private investigator or as a potential source. And when do you, when are you being too insistent with information that is just like not there at all that they just don't have and they're counting on you to find this information because this also mm -hmm. happens in the case of uh, working as a strategist, some clients will go well, I expect you to find this out, actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want yeah. whatever that thing is. Uh, and that's an interesting one, I think. Or there's also there's also the uh, parallel of depending on what your NDA looks like 
depending on if they're a publicly traded company or not, if they're in the midst of a merger or an acquisition of some kind, other business dealings that they are doing that are more about a longer term strategy, you may not be privy to that uh, for legal reasons or for privacy concerns. And so even though that information would be helpful to you, you're not going to be given it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's something to also kind of recognize what stage is my client's company at in their larger development and growth? Uh, and what, uh, how may that impact the usefulness and relevance of the information I can bring them? Yeah. And, and from the question that we said at the beginning that you'd mentioned that you kind of fell into role-playing games through meeting yeah. people, but also, and I, I did some improv as well. So both when I was younger and in Chicago, younger in Paris uh, and around Paris, uh, the question that we looked at at uh, the beginning, like what's the, what do you think the benefits are or the advantage of trying the, or playing role-playing games overall? Like what do you think are, what, what are those for you? Yeah. Let's say? Well, I mean, one well, advantage. Actually, what kind of pleasure and what kind of, you know, what do you get out of it? Uh, oh God, I can talk about that forever. But okay, great, uh, one of the, I think just building off what you were just saying, um, around asking questions. Uh, I mean, without getting like too big about it, um, you know, growing up and stuff, we're often taught how to be listeners. Yeah. What, what's a good listener? But we're not also often taught to be, what's a good engager? What's a good conversationalist? And not for the purposes of holding court uh, and having everyone pay attention to you, but for the purposes of understanding and dialogue uh, and connection. And I, and in, you know, research for work, we have the benefit of stepping into conversations loaded with background information, loaded with objectives and loaded with um, permission to have the conversation uh, and a discussion guide. So I have pre spent a lot of time thinking, about what's the flow that the conversation needs to have to create a safe enough space that we are gonna get to the deeper stuff that is actually the meat of the work. Uh, so that's a lot just, of- I'll stop you for a second. For anybody who is doesn't know what you're talking about, I believe, or you just specify, but I, you, what you just talked about with discussion guides is having conversations with people for the purpose of research, right? That you were yeah, so qualitative advance. research yeah. to understand consumers, to understand cultural narratives, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so we usually, I come in, in, in the rest of life, we don't usually have discussion guides. No, well, that's, that's exactly where I'm going. Yeah. I come in very much in control of the conversation, even though where we end up is going to be led by the person I'm speaking to. And so I find this sort of exercise very useful because it puts me in a situation where I have to have that conversation. I have to think about flow and setup. Uh, and you know how I want one thing to build on the other so that I can create a more linear narrative in my own mind to work with and having opportunities where I don't get to do the pre-thinking, I don't know the situation I'm going into makes me much more flexible and dynamic for the for the times when that does show up unexpectedly in a research interview that you imagine it's going to go this way and it doesn't, similar to, to improv, Improv makes you comfortable physically being in that situation, but the role-playing games, uh, because they are more structured than, than improv is, uh, it does teach you how to drive conversations in the moment while still being a collaborator. Yeah, Like absolutely. you had objectives, of, I'm sure you were thinking, I really want her to do this. I'm thinking I really want him to give me this information. And so we have two different objectives coming into the conversation. Um, so yeah, I think being able to manage that on the fly is, is a useful skill. Yeah, and it's funny because it's a triptych with the, the improv side of things. Uh, there are a lot of uh, role-playing game designers who would say and talk about the fact that like for anybody asking them questions on like, how do I be a better role player, they're like, well, go take an improv class. So, mm -hmm. which is the same for how to be a strategist. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say, whenever try people role ask, games, for sure. They're like, what training should I get? And I'm like, yeah, I've got fancy degrees. I've done that kind of stuff. But like the best training I had was improv and uh, doing radio, talking to people, just talking to people. Okay. Did you do radio as well? 
Yeah, in my 20s, I had a hip hop radio show for five years. Fantastic. I was really cool once upon a time. <laughs> and now I'm a nerdy game player. <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry, but it is very, very cool. Like role playing games are Dragons, cool now. It's super cool now at the moment. It is I, cool now. Yeah. The a, satanic panic is over. It's over. I, I came across <laughs> a screenshot that I loved uh, of a, it was a Twitter conversation screenshot. So I don't even know if it's real or not, but I just love it. Uh, this lady saying she's a journalist showed up at the arcade and there are kids around uh, and speaks to the kid who are like, uh, anyway, uh, uh, something like that. And, um, and she says, oh, so you, I guess, well, you don't really play those kinds of old school arcade games anymore. I'm, I imagine everybody's on Fortnite now. And the kid goes, well, no, I mean, Fortnite's so yesterday. She's like, really? Is it? What's cool now? He's like, well, have you heard of that thing called Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. My nine-year-old nephew is part of a and d group out of school. That's awesome. And they, they play weekly. Yeah. He's super into it. That's I was just thinking another thing that I think is a useful crossover between the type of work that we do and playing these sorts of games mm -hmm. is the need to let things go. Mm -hmm. So you can have an idea in your mind that you're like, oh, I really will hope the game goes in this direction or I hope my character gets to do this or I hope another character, if you're playing with, you know, cooperatively, I hope another character drives the story in this direction or I hope that thing that that, that the game master said you know, two games ago is going to play out this way down the road, and it totally may not. And in order to be a contributing positive member of that experience for everyone else, you have to let that stuff go. And that's just like you have to let go of the creative that you thought was super cool but didn't test well, uh, or that isn't moving the product but is a cool idea but is not meeting the objectives of the actual project, or, you know, someone else is just opposed to the idea for whatever reason. And you you don't want to spend the game fighting with that person to change them into the story that you're trying to tell. That is a it really has to good be point. the story everyone, all the stakeholders are trying to tell together. And sometimes that means you were right, and they don't find that out till later. But uh, buy-in is far more important than being right, because buy-in leads to action, whereas being right. Uh, doesn't inspire anyone. No, and it's just anything. sticking to your position and it doesn't really, does, it's, yeah, not, it's so, not moving forward. If you're sticking to the position, you're not being mobile, you're not being fluid, you're not yeah. being forward. Yeah. And totally. even though in like retrospect, sometimes brand strategy, you're like in retrospect, we should have gone in that direction that maybe felt more like a risk or felt kind of unclear to us, but we see what the benefit would have been now. But if you don't have the buy-in, you don't have the team being interested in taking that forward and putting some of their skin in it, uh, it doesn't matter if it's the better idea because it won't result in the better execution or rollout. The idea that has the energy behind it is the one that's going to take you the farthest. Totally. Great. I think yeah. this is a great place to end. Uh, I'll just, uh, we'll just do a couple of minutes of uh, what I usually finish with a couple of cool down questions because uh, it's sure. like ice cream cool down. Uh, talking about <laughs> ice cream, actually, I know it's, like, it's very original. Um, do you have a favorite flavor? Do you like ice cream and have a favorite flavor? I do. It's kind of boring. Mint chocolate chip. Yeah. It's usually one of the recurring most favorite ones. So is it okay. really? Yeah, it is. It's so refreshing. It's just so refreshing. It's like real mint and real chocolate. It's <laughs> Do you just have so a delightful. favorite brand of mint chocolate chip? In Toronto, we have quite a few gourmet, like small batch ice nice. cream makers. Uh, so Death by Gelato is uh, is one in Toronto that I really like. And also Bang Bang. Okay, I don't know that one. I know the Death by Gelato. They're Gelato. small batch. Great. Uh, what's the latest uh, piece of art or media that had an impact on you that you would love to share with others? So it could be anything, could be a book, could be a TV show, could be a painting. Or it could huh. be a game, actually. Yeah, that had a, that had an impact. Yeah. However you however that whatever whatever kind of impact. I would so this is kind of funny. It was uh maybe it was six weeks ago. Uh do you do you watch much stand-up comedy? No, a bit. No, I'm not a I'm not a super expert at all. But uh, I know some, obviously, I, I do watch some on Netflix and I've seen some okay. in live as well. So I, I like them, but I, I, I don't know if I'm going to know who you're talking about. <laughs> so I love stand-up comedians because I think the good ones are actually anthropologists. 
uh, and so for it, if it's oh yeah, and the oh, observational the comedy, which is yeah. super prevalent now, is is exactly. I that. love it. Yeah. So there's this uh, comic Mike Berbiglia. Uh, his stuff is on is on Netflix, but he's been doing this great thing during COVID uh, where he does pizza parties, and you sign up, you log in with your Zoom with your camera up, and he practices his jokes and That's gets cool. live feedback from the people who are there, and you can. And the, the thing it's like that it's the hit equivalent me, of an open mic night, the way you would test jokes. Totally. The, and the thing that hit me was um, how much I missed hearing other people react to things that I'm also seeing in that moment. So the spontaneous laughter, the person with like the too loud, weird laugh, the person who snorts, the person who is eating their pizza too loud or is like laughing at the at the wrong moments. And you're like, why are they laughing at that moment? Uh, but having your experience be filtered through the experiences of those around you as well and new ways to have that feel more enriching. And also I think as someone who works in ideas uh, and is, you know, only as good as their last idea and their last project, which is very similar to comedians, only as good as their, their last joke, really uh, to see someone who is, you know, at the top of their game workshopping so humbly um was a good reminder to me that everyone is always learning everyone is always you know trying new things and has failures and successes uh and the main thing is is that you just keep working at it and, and that's you know with our with our work too you know we can start the session can start with like we have some pretty bad ideas but if you just like work it and work it and work it and bring in the ideas and take the criticism and don't get your ego in the way and watching him just like work a joke until it got like really funny was really inspiring. It's fantastic. Great. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much for your time. This was a lot of fun, Colleen. Thank you. It was really fun. I'm oh. going to be uh, feeling like a gumshoe for the rest of the day. Yes, exactly. <laughs>